Okay, yeah, thank you to LinkTime, the organizers, and our various hosts here in France. Uh, it's, is it playing? Okay, ever seen a chair built with, uh, with only three legs? Pro probably not, because it's virtually impossible to forget one of the legs when you're building a chair. But in software, it happens all the time. Software is too abstract that it's too easy for us to forget a piece of the picture and have bugs. W what has research shown to be the most effective method of finding bugs? Is it reading code, automated testing, beta testing, formal verification? All these things are great, and Yoichi is working on formal verification. That's really good. The basic answer is that people reading code is the most effective way of finding bugs. To paraphrase this quote, formal design and code inspections can find bugs up to 85% of the time, about twice those of any form of testing. Another book titled Code Complete compiled more research and had similar conclusions that reading code is better at catching bugs then regression tests, system unit tests, integration tests, system tests. This is a chart with data from the book. Might be hard to read, but at the top are the lower percentages, and the first ones there is regression tests. You can see that it has a low percentage, along with many other testing. And as you continue reading at the bottom, there's the higher percentages ones, and you can see that formal design and code inspections have higher percentages. The important message here is not to do less testing. No one in their right mind would, do, would advocate that. The, the important message is that write as many tests as you can and then do more design and code reviews and inspections and to do them more formally and rigorously and to improve and to invest in improving their effectiveness. When software is decentralized, who owns its security? While the developers of the software play a large role in its security, a price of decentralized software may mean that its security is the responsibility of the community around that software, basically all of us. The software will either be defended by the community or be attacked and crumble at the hands of black hat attackers. Thus, when you're writing smart contracts and decentralized applications, or dApps for short, you want to recruit troops and as much of the community to join you in the battle against black hats. This talk will discuss three parts. First, our specs. Second, our tests. Third, our rollout plans. These are mentioned in the smart contract best practices document in GitHub, but have not been discussed as thoroughly as will be in this talk. The Smart Contract Best Practices has a lot of tips about Solidity, which I also presented at DevCon 2. And for those that want to see some code, the fourth part will be a reminder about the potential dangers when you have a smart contract making an external call to an untrusted contract. Here's the Smart Contract Best Practices document on GitHub. Feel free to submit a pull request for anything. If people reading code detects the most bugs, how can this process be improved? There is no silver bullet, but I think that specifications, specs, go a very long way. Have most of you seen this kind of tree swimming cartoon? Can this, any hands who've seen it? Okay, great. So that's what I thought. So most of, most of everyone has seen this. It's a masterpiece showing what can and does happen when there's a lack of specs for software. Because software is abstract, it is so easy for it to be misunderstood, misinterpreted, and full of bugs. We need to help each other with a picture, and the simplest way is with specs. We should produce more specs, diagrams, and useful documentation that paints the picture of the software for our community and troops. When writing smart contracts or any software, we need to communicate better our assumptions, expectations, and understanding of our code. We must reduce the common practice of letting others fill in the blanks about what the code does. We need to reduce the effort that it takes before someone can put the pieces of the puzzle together to even just get a glimpse of what the code is, might be doing. 
We need to avoid writing software that is based on minimal specs or sparse descriptions that two are a handful of people that can read each other's minds and implement. Specs help recruit troops and come with other benefits. For example, bugs in specs are the cheapest to fix. Bugs in a deployed system are much more expensive to fix. Also, tools like formal verification will only help as much as the specs you provide to them. Do you know anyone who has ever built a house from a description that needs to have a front door, back door, and windows on all sides? No, you have specs and blueprints showing very precisely how large the doors are and windows, where are they located, which way they open, and so forth. We need to try to be more thorough with specs and then work hard to make it clear what they mean, reduce ambiguities and misunderstandings, and reduce cognitive load for our troops. Most of us, if not all of us, know all these things already, but I'd like to remind the community how critically valuable specs are, and ideally, specs that can be simplified, explained with examples, and paint a picture so that more people can understand them easier. Specs also take territory away from black hats. Black hats don't often lurk in the daylight of the obvious, but in the darkness of subtleties and quirks, like the self-destruct that Martin mentioned, where much fewer white hats, good guys, and community members roam. The old state bloat attacks and the attacks with mispriced opcodes are examples of a black hat simply probing areas of Ethereum that few ever did. Very few of the community knew these dark areas, and even fewer inspected them. Tests are coding specs. An easy way for new people to understand your code is sometimes by looking at your tests. People can also look for gaps in tests, and they might find a bug that way. For example, if there's a function that's only testing even or positive numbers, you'd have to ask why isn't it testing odd and negative numbers? There's a lot to say about automated tests. You'd have, like, they are priceless for catching regression bugs caused by refactoring. Briefly, I'll say to write as many tests as you can and at the same time focus on design and code reviews and inspections. It's not completely accurate that reading code catches the most bugs. You may have caught in that earlier chart that the code complete book lists a method more effective than formal design and code inspections. And that is high volume beta tests with more than 1,000 users. This leads to the importance of having rollout plans and deployment plans for your software and smart contracts. When will you allow users to interact with your software? How much time will you allow before deploying to production? Rollout plans should include when specs will be announced to the public, allocate time for their feedback, time for fixing specs, updating and improving them. Rollout plans should cover the deployment phases like test nets, alpha tests, and beta tests. It's ideal to have high volume te beta tests with more than 1,000 users, but might only be feasible in production. A production system needs baking time in production. The strongest swords are forged by repeatedly putting them in fire and hammering them. It takes time. Specs help improve our troops, help in inform our troops where the battlefield is. They help shine the light on dark areas and weaknesses where reinforcements may be desired. Rollout and deployment plans give time for our troops to act, probe, identify weaknesses, and set up defenses. Both specs and rollout plans make it easier for more troops to join the battle. Now it's time for a solidity tip and some code. Contracts calling each other is powerful and can lead to emergent use cases, but care must be taken for external calls that a contract makes. The recommendation is to avoid calls to untrusted contracts as much as you can. Untrusted means any contract that you have not written. This is because if you call someone else's contract, they or one of their dependencies could accidentally call a malicious contract. In the chain of contract calls, all it takes is for one contract to make a mistake. Thus assume that untrusted contracts are malicious. Avoid calling do something or address.call on an untrusted contract. The key point here is that after any untrusted call, Assume that the state of your contract has been manipulated. Here's a diagram 
to help. There's a few things here, but let's start with the left side at the foo function. It decrements x and then it calls an untrusted contract, which is the red arrow. The fallback function of the untrusted contract executes and it can call foo, an example of recursive reentrancy. It's important to re realize that reentrancy can use any of the contract's public functions, meaning an attacker can re-enter using the function g or the function bar. This is why after the untrusted call, the contract cannot assume anything at all about the values of x or y. Before closing, a reminder about unknown unknowns and other security tips. An example of something that could attack us but is unknown is a compiler bug. Compiler bugs have the potential to be nasty because the Solidity code itself could be thoroughly reviewed by many, many people. But, but very few are examining the compiled EVM bytecode. And of the few, it would not be surprising if most of them were black hats. Solidity, Solidity devs are doing a very solid job. But especially if you're close to launching, for safety, be careful of the latest version of the Solidity compiler. Latest versions of the compiler have had less time to harden, may introduce new compiler bugs. And if you've been testing thoroughly with an older version of the compiler, you're probably safer sticking to that version. Be careful as well when using the Solidity optimizer. Evaluate the benefits you get against the potential risks of bugs from the optimizer. Be careful of using esoteric Solidity features. For more safety, you want to stick with the features of Solidity that are used the most because it's more likely that bugs have been detected and fixed with such features. When you use a Solidity feature that less people have used, there's higher risk of bug that no one encountered yet, and you probably don't want to be the first one to do so. Reusing code that has been more tested and reviewed is another way to reduce risks. Check out EIP-190 for, for package management, as well as Zeppelin Solidity. And be aware of blockchain, Solidity, and EVM properties which the QR code on this slide helps with. To conclude, the security of decentralized software largely depends on the community. Write as many tests as you can, and at the same time focus on design and code inspections to find even more bugs. We need to provide specs. The easier to understand, the better, so that more people can read the code, gain an understanding of it, and help identify security holes. Specs help us recruit troops and shine light on areas and weaknesses that are more vulnerable for black hats to exploit. We need to roll out carefully and allow time for troops to understand, examine, and probe the code. And we need to allow the time for code to harden. Strategically, recruiting our troops, recruiting troops and having specs and rollout plans will help us in the battle against black hats. On the tactical front, the QR code here has many tips. Again, a lot of them were discussed in DevCon 2. It was a much more technical talk than this one, but I thought for, it would be best to uh, have a different talk at this event. Calling untrusted code is always dangerous. The danger may seem small, but if an attacker finds and exploits a bug in a compiler targeting the EVM, they are likely to do much more damage if their untrusted code is also executed than one where they only have a compiler bug to work with. Finally, some bugs are only manifested when there are many users interacting with a system or when time has passed so that a creative spark by someone discovers something that everyone else has missed. Rollout plans should try to increase the likelihood of these scenarios. And specs are a way to combat the abstract nature of software that causes many bugs. For security, we need as many troops on our side 
We need to communicate as much as we can about our software and make it easy for each other and the community to understand our software and contribute to its security. Black hats don't stay in the daylight, but lurk in the shadows of subtleties, complexities, and edge cases. Try to shine a bright light on those areas so that more troops can help defend. And here are some, some references, and not sure how much time we have, can take questions. Yeah, within consensus, yeah, this is, yeah, I asked for specs, yeah, quite a few things and, yeah, rollout plans as well. But, um, yeah, a lot of this, I guess, is we can see from the, you know, from, from the Black Hats attacking, like, the core protocol itself and all those things, if they come across your actual own application, right, you, you know, you really need as much help and troops as you need, right? So I think these are suggestions. Because when our code is so complicated, it's only when, if there's only like five or ten other people that can understand their, our code, then we're not going to get as much help. Are, are you going to try and get, uh, you know, uh, code that you working for projects through consensus? Yes, yeah, there, yeah, those, those, yeah, there are those plans as well yeah, happening within consensus. Because even consensus, there are many um, projects already happening. So, yeah, those are some ideas that have been suggested. Oh. Yeah, so first question was if I have any data about the effectiveness of bug bounties. No, I haven't looked into, um, yeah, I don't have any d data on that. And the second question is about uh, how to incentivize the community about bug bounties. Yeah, bug bounties are definitely a thing that we mentioned as well in the document. I, when I was writing this, maybe I spoke through this talk very, very quickly. I didn't get time to talk about, but I do think that bug bounties are a really important part as well. I think, um, yeah, Yoichi has his $10,000 plus dollar bug bounty that he announced you know, a few hours ago. So I think that's at least a good, good, good step for us to try. Uh, from experience with consensus, yeah, we have gotten um, yeah, some, yeah, some reports through bug bounties, so it does, does help us. What, what are the other way? Uh, sorry. Question there? Uh, yeah, so, so basically, if I'm breaking a smart country, and I wanted to get a review, what are the, is there only big bounties or is there anything else I can do? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah. If, so the question is, are there, uh, are there other methods apart from bug bounties to try to get um, people to review, to review your code? So there are, so some of the other ways that I, I know of is that certain other projects like Gnosis, they have their own Slack as well. They get a bunch of feedback that way, so they they're already building their own own community of um, supporters, and those supporters are you know give, giving feedback on different things. So it's yeah, I guess with, within the larger Ethereum community, you also have to try to build your own smaller community. But again, I think part of it is, is if you're able to really write things, blog posts explaining things. Um, the Gnosis auction is one of the more complicated um, auction, you know, novel. It's also quite novel that may be harder for people to understand, but I think they've done a pretty good job of writing blog posts about that. So I think the more communication that you can put out there that more people can understand and take time with it, because it does take time for people to understand as well, it, it only helps the project. As a normal dApp developer, what can you do against uh, compiler bugs uh, apart from being conservative and sticking to an old version? And in general, is there a way we can help people writing compilers finding bugs? Does it make sense to compare 
different versions, so uh, a compiler contract against different versions of a compiler and compare the behavior. Yeah, so what can we do as, as non-compiler writers? Yeah, the question is, yeah, as, as DAP developers, what can we do to help avoid compiler bugs or help, help find them? Uh, yeah, my, I touched a little bit on the first one, you know, how you can help avoid um, compiler bugs and some of the techniques there are, yeah, basically, if you keep, if your contract just does things that, you know, most other contracts are doing, you're less likely to, to hit a compiler bug because otherwise pe people would have hit, hit them already. But if you start doing um, too many things that, you know, less and less contracts are doing, um, let's say like, yeah, raw calls in Solidity, you know, they've been out there for a while now, but, you know, they're not too, too highly recommended raw calls. So, you know, for, for some reason, there might be some, so, some, some issue with something like that. Um, so yeah, the, I think the best way is if you're doing things complicated, that's when you really have to pay more, more attention if there might be issues against compiler bugs. I'm not sure what, how we can um, contribute feedback to uh, Christian and the Solidity team on such things, but I know that, um, yeah, we can see from Yuichi's talk as well that, you know, they're looking more at the compiler level bytecode to really help sort, sort those things out. 